Welcome to the Forest Park 7. So we appreciate it. Um, and we appreciate all the, the folks that run it as well. So thank you to our AV team and video team. And um, have a few announcements. Uh, so uh, you can see in the bulletin uh, that there's the uh, Wednesday Bible study. And you can see the topics there for the next two. Um, also, after the service, I will be off in the room to the side or in the hall. If uh, anyone has a special prayer request, uh, feel free to uh, come on over and um, we can have a, a prayer together. Um, also, just uh, we have a, a couple of different things going on. Um, and uh, some of them, due to weather or other things, are, are actually being canceled or postponed. So you'll see in your bulletin there was a mention of a Pathfinder fundraiser. That is not going to be happening today. Um, also, there was volleyball. That, again, will not be happening today either. Um, and then... Uh, Let's see, is there anything else? And then we have an announcement from our school. So. Good morning. All right, I want everybody to pull your green piece of paper out of your bulletins. Because when you pull something out, you remember things. When you write things, you remember it better. So pull it out. It says, light of the world. I want to invite everybody here and online to come to our Christmas program on December 8th. The school out there, we've been practicing really, really hard, and we can't wait to share our Christmas program with you guys. So because I've had you pull this out, I'm hoping this will help you remember. And in fact, you can even pull out your phone and put it in your calendar. That would be good. All right, so I invite you guys all to come, bring a friend, and come enjoy Christmas with us. Thank you. Good morning, Good morning to the intrepid few who have arrived in church through the snow. Um, it's been an interesting year. We had a dark, cold Sabbath, and now we have a lighted, warm inside, cold outside Sabbath. And it is inevitable that I am going to ask you to stand and sing Christmas songs with me this morning, because I can't resist. Um, it's, it's just, it's a hopeful, exercise. Go ahead and stand. Jesus is coming. He came. He's coming again. What more do we have to celebrate? We're going to sing Angels from the Realms of Glory. Angels from the realms of glory bring your flight Thank you. 
If you bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you sent your Son here to this earth to be our Savior. And we thank you that we can be here and online to worship you today on the Sabbath day, the day that you set aside after creating our earth for us to be with you and to know that you are God. We thank you for all the blessings that you've given us, and we ask that you would be with us as we are here today in your church. Amen. Please be seated. We are singing um, four songs today, one of which is not printed in the bulletin. We're starting with hymn number 138, and um, not everybody knows this song. It's called Rise Up, Shepherd, and Follow. So if you do follow music, it'd be easier for you to follow um, with your hymnal. But again, we need to follow just as the shepherds follow. <laughs> several versions and verses so just follow the words on the screen and after we've sung the third verse of Silent Night there will be a short transition of, with the musicians and we're going to transition into the song Isn't He. Oh, sing, hallelujah, 
for the first time today. It is a beautiful song with a beautiful message. Please join in as much as you possibly can.
Good morning. We have a very special event today, so I would like to invite the Mabiala family to come forward at this time. Now, many of you know Eve and Claudine and the, all of the kids. They are not strangers to this congregation, but Tanya and Tara have not been dedicated yet. And today is that special day when they will be dedicated to the Lord. So welcome up here on the stage, family and ladies especially. I'm so glad that you are here with us. Now, as you know, since you have asked, the practice of dedicating children goes back a long, long time. It goes all the way back to the time of Moses, when we find that Moses was dedicated to the Lord as the firstborn child. Well, he wasn't the firstborn, but they dedicated firstborns at that time. And Today, we're no longer bound by things like the Levitical priesthood where we only dedicate the firstborn or we only dedicate males. No, no, no. Since the time of Jesus, every one of us is considered a priest to God and we dedicate everyone, regardless whether we are Greek or uh, Jew, whether we are slave or free, whether we are male or female. We are all precious and holy to God. Now, the story um, that we're probably the most familiar with regarding a child dedication is the story of Samuel. Samuel was brought by his mother Hannah to the temple. Well, I guess it was more of a tent of meeting at that time. They didn't have a temple. But he was brought to Eli the priest, and his mother dedicated him to God. And we know that Samuel went on to do incredible things um, by God working through him in his life. He dedicated or he anointed King Saul to be king over Israel. He anointed King David to be king over Israel. He did some things that I'm going to talk about in my sermon later today, but he did incredible things on God's behalf. Now, we're not saying that Tanya and Tara are going to go into professional ministry by being dedicated to God, but we are saying that their lives are very special they are precious to God, and that you, Eve, you, Claudine, are committing to raising your two daughters in the way of the Lord. That's what we are saying here today. Jesus was also very fond of children, as I'm sure you know. Much to the frustration of his disciples and their aspirations for Jesus, Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, verse 14, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And in verse 16, Jesus continues, he says, and he took them in his arms and blessed them and laid hands on them. So today, in accordance with the example given to us by Jesus Christ, as well as the rest of scripture, we are going to dedicate Tanya and Tara. Church family, do you Commit to do all within your power to help these girls grow up in the way of the Lord. Would you, um, if that is your intention, please give a hearty amen and wave your hands. Amen. All right. And Eve, Claudine, do you commit to raise Tanya and Tara to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and to live their lives after his example for us? Yes, we do. All right. Well, if it's all right, I'm going to come over in between you guys. John and you might have to scoot to the side so I can put my hand on these two girls' shoulders. Is that all right, girls? Can I do that? All right. And then we're going to have a special prayer. And mom and dad, get close too. Put your hands on them as well. John and as well. All right. And let's bow our heads for a special word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, come before you today. We want to give you praise and honor and glory. And we celebrate the lives of Tanya and Tara. And Lord, we ask in a very special way today that as they are being set apart by their parents, that you would bless them tremendously. We pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit in ways that you have not before. We pray that you would pour out your Spirit with a double portion. We pray that they would have health, tremendous physical health, incredible intellectual powers, but more than anything, Lord, we pray for a deep spiritual capacity with these young ladies, that many people would be in your kingdom because of their witness for you. Lord, I pray that you would bless this family as well. I ask that their home would be a place of safety, that their home would be a place where 
these children can grow and truly be young ladies, but also a place that nurtures them as they grow to become godly women. And Lord, we just pray that they would be a blessing to all that they come in contact with. So this is my prayer, dear Jesus, for Tanya and for Tara Mabiala, as we dedicate them to you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Right. If our uh, deacons would, uh, and deaconesses would come forward, it's time for our offering. Uh, today's offering is for our local church budget, and I know I've mentioned before, I did not find out until I was an adult that tithe did not help keep the lights on in the church. It's the local church budget offering that does that and many of the other things here locally in our church. Our tithes help pay for our pastor's salary and things at our conference level, but not the physical needs of the building here. So just want everybody to remember uh, to give to our local church. And the, the reading today, the story, reminds us that in the Bible, we have some examples of where God prepares ahead of time. So the story of Joseph and the famine in Egypt, right? There was seven years before that they had warning to, and seven years of abundance to prepare and then seven years of famine. And then sometimes, though, we, we kind of forget that God is still there. He's not just from the time long ago in the Bible. And there's an example of a family that were in another country, uh, working in another country during COVID. And right at the beginning of COVID, a lot of people were losing their jobs. And, you know, it, it was rough, right? And so... Um, they, in particular, were blessed with being able to, to keep their jobs, but they, they kind of had some foresight, and they started saving. And seven, seven months after COVID, uh, the mother's work visa expired, and her job had to lay her off. She was still in the country because her husband still had a job, but they only had you know, half their income. And they lived on that savings that they had saved up for those seven months Well, they worked all of that paperwork. God plans ahead for us. And if you recall, a few weeks ago, uh, we had a lot of testimonies. And me and my wife have seen this in our life. Sometimes my job has some certain things where um, if, if you do certain things, you, you can get uh, a bonus, a small bonus, right? And, and you know it's coming. Maybe you just don't know what paycheck it'll come in. And we've had where, you know, you start planning and going, oh, we're going to get ahead in this or that. And then you have a car problem that is lots of money and the next check here's that bonus god takes care of us he can see the future and he plans ahead for us let's pray dear heavenly father we thank you for the great care that you have for us that you can see our futures and you plan for us and you take care of us now and always we ask your blessings on the offerings here today amen
Good morning. Our scripture meeting this morning is 1 Samuel 7, 12. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mezpah and Shen and called its name Ebenezer. For he said, till now the Lord has helped us. Uh, you join me for prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we come here to your house to be with you, to worship you, to thank you for the blessings that you give us, to ask you to continue to be with us, to protect us, to guide us. We thank you that uh, you do just so many things for us. A lot of them we don't always even think about because they occur every second, every breath that we take you have given us, truly everything we have. We thank you for these things and we ask that your Holy Spirit would be here with us and with those in their homes watching online to help us grow closer to you today as we worship. And we ask that you'd send your Holy Spirit to be with our pastor and his family so that his words can bless us today and that you'll continue to protect him and his family as they serve you and serve us. We thank you for everything that you do, and we thank you for our school and the blessings you have given our school and the fact that it is overflowing and we may need to have another teacher in the future. We just appreciate the blessings that you give us. And this time of year, as we grow um, or draw closer to Christmas, we just are reminded more than we, we maybe are the rest of the year of the sacrifice that you gave for us by coming to this earth and being born and then your sacrifice on the cross. And we just thank you. And we thank your father for giving his son for all of us. We ask that you'd bring your peace that only you can give to all of us here today as we journey with you to learn more about you and to grow closer to you. We thank you for everything in your holy and precious name. Amen. We now have children's story, so if the children want to come on down and collect the offering on the way that goes to our school and to help our school. We have the little building, school building here that they can put it in. So. the snow you guys still showed up good job 
All right, so do you guys ever have something that you really, really like? Maybe it's a toy, an animal, ice cream, okay. I'm, I'm right with you, Amelia. Um, so I really, really like horses, okay? As you can see on my screen, all right there, I love horses, okay? As a little kid, I dreamed about horses. I rode horses. I talked about horses. I even had shirts with horses on it. I love horses, okay? So, um, as a kid, I read Bible verses, and one of the Bible verses that I read was Matthew 7, 7, and I'm gonna read it with you guys, okay? It says, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find, knock, and it will be opened to you. Who, for whoever who has asked will receive, and one who seeks finds, and one that knocks will be opened. So I like, wait a second, if I ask, if I ask very, very nicely to God, not that I can do that, I'm just going to ask and I'm going to ask for a baby horse. Do you think I'm going to give it, get it? I have a horse, you can see it on my screen. Do you think I could, oh, not yet, don't turn that page yet. Chris, back up. <laughs> you just spoiled my story. All right, so now, okay, so I asked and I asked, and you know what, somebody came along and saw my, the, my mom's horse, that is my mom's horse, her name is Lady, or was, um, she, he came like, hey, you know what, I feel like I give your daughter, who loves horses, a baby horse. So he uh, took my mom's horse and um, his horse, they had a nice relationship and they and she ended up pregnant so I waited and waited and waited and finally I'm like wait a second God I have a baby horse that's coming but I'm gonna add to my story my uh, my prayer request so my prayer request is like hey can I see my baby horse be born which is very rare doesn't always happen so I kept praying I kept praying my my story my prayer and one night, I was like, wait a second, I think it's going to happen. So that very night, I put, put up my tent, and the, that morning, I was able to watch my horse um, be born. And there she is. That is very rare, guys. Okay? You don't usually get to see a baby horse, because the mom doesn't really like it. Okay? So the next morning, I was, my horse got up. Okay, now you can turn. <laughs> And I was able to see my horse, all right? And the next, and then my, my horse, his name's Stormy, and she grew up, next slide. <laughs> there she go. That is my horse today. In fact, my mom just sent me that picture. So fast forwarding to my horse grew up. I trained her and I can ride her. I fast forward to when I went to college. My horse was still at home. And I still was dreaming of a horses, still loved horses, and I met a guy at college. He was a city guy. He, did, <laughs> he didn't know anything about country or about the farm or anything like I grew up. So one weekend, I'm like, you know what? I really want to go see my horse. Can you, would you be willing to go with me to the weekend, uh, on the weekend, and go see my horse? And of course, being the good boyfriend at the time was, he's like, sure, why not? I've always wanted to learn about horses. So we went and visited one weekend, and we were out in the pasture, and Stormy out here was, she's the lead mare in the herd, so meaning the lead is meaning she's the boss, okay? You don't mess with boss horses, okay? I'm telling you. And so he and I were out in the field giving apples, feeding apples. Do you think horses like apples? Yeah. Yeah, they love apples. So, my boyfriend at the time, <laughs> we're feeding horses, and he gave it to Stormy, and Stormy came and ate it, and then he went off and fed, was feeding the next 12, no, seven horses that we had, and he was feeding her, and Stormy is like, wait a second, you have a whole bag of apples, and you're not giving it to me. And so Stormy, She's like, ah. So she came up and she was going to go grab more apples from her, him. And I, you know what I did? 
it was snowing, kind of like out here. I pushed him down really hard. <laughs> and he's like, what was that? And I'm like, you know what? Stormy wanted all your other apples. She didn't want her other, her other members of the herd to have any of them. So she was being very, very selfish. And you know what? So I pushed you down, and I'm teaching my horse a lesson of how not to be selfish. So here's my two points that I want you to walk away from today. Is one, ask your... Um, ask for God for things. I'm not promising horses. I'm not asking your wishes are always going to be the same, but he will always answer. It'll be either a yes answer or a no answer, but he will always answer your prayers. And, and second one, don't be selfish like Stormy is, okay? So if you want something, don't be selfish and realize that there's other people that want that same thing, okay? So you can go back to your seats. Thank you. Good morning again. Happy Sabbath. I would love to say it's good to be back in the snow, but last Sabbath I was on Oahu and I was in the Kailua church and they have those big glass panes that they can open up and slide and so the entire side of both, uh, or the, the wall on both sides of the church was wide open and there was a fresh breeze blowing in. It was, it was pretty rough, but I figured somebody needed to attend church there, so. <laughs> no, it is good to be here with you, church family. I am happy to be here. Would you all bow your heads with me? Gracious Lord, we come into your presence today. We ask that you would fill this room with your Holy Spirit. Though we do not have a tropical breeze blowing here, Lord, we ask that you would warm our hearts with your presence. Lord, we know that you desire to be with us and we ask that you fulfill that desire in this moment. Lord, I ask that you hide me in the shadow of your cross, that these words would be yours and not mine. Amen. Amen. Well, in the year 1843, a man by the name of Charles Dickens published a little novella, which is a small little story or book, a little novel, called A Christmas Carol. How many of you have heard of A Christmas Carol? Many of you have heard of A Christmas Carol. In fact, if your English teacher in high school was worth their salt, you probably read A Christmas Carol when you were in high school in English class. Well, there's lots of good things you could read, so you probably had good English teachers. Anyway, even if you didn't read it. Well, this has become one of my favorite Christmas stories. I was first introduced to A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens by attending Scrooge the Musical down in Tacoma at the Champion Center. I don't know if any of you have ever been there, but I had never heard of it, but my family always went to this program every Christmas. It was wonderful. They have a live orchestra, they sing, they dance, and they tell the story, and they incorporate some humor along the way. It was only a bit later in life, probably middle elementary school, that I'm like, wait a second, that's Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Oh, and then I put all the pieces together, as children oftentimes do, because we learn more through experience rather than just through uh, learning you know, from the paper and the book. Well, Dickens wrote A Christmas Carol during a time when the English especially, but you know, most of Europe during the Victorian era was trying to figure out what exactly are we doing with Christmas? What, you know, they knew what it was about, but their traditions were not quite like they are today. And so Dickens' A Christmas Carol became one of the very common things that helped people to kind of set many of the norms for the season, such as the Christmas tree and what you eat for Christmas dinner and what the holiday is all about. And in fact, perhaps if he had not written it, we might not have all of the traditions just exactly the way we do today. Now, don't uh, be confused, he wasn't the only one making a contribution to culture at the time, but he did make kind of that 
pinnacle of the cultural contribution. The, uh, a Christmas Carol centers around the main character, the protagonist, Ebenezer Scrooge. Now, Ebenezer Scrooge is a miserly old man who is quite miserable company. No one wants to be around him, not even those he pays for working for him. And he has lots and lots of money because, well, that's the thing he cares about most in life. He's, as he's getting older, he comes to the Christmas holiday and you know, basically demands that his worker would come in on Christmas Day and would be deprived of spending time with his family, and he's just as grouchy as ever. And then that night, he's visited by four ghosts. Now, I don't agree with the theology. We can't ever consume popular culture without our thinking cap on. We always have to keep our thinking cap on. However, we can still learn things even if we don't agree with the theology, right? Yes, okay, we can still learn things even if we don't agree with the theology. So Ebenezer Scrooge in his sleep is visited by four ghosts. The first is his former business partner, Jacob Marley. And Jacob Marley comes and talks with him and tells him that he is going to be visited subsequently that night by three other ghosts. The ghost of Christmas past, the ghost of Christmas present, and the ghost of Christmas yet to come. Well... The ghost of Christmas past comes, and he takes him in vision to see Mr. Fezziwig, his first employer, and he sees Mr. Fezziwig's daughter, Belle, and recalls a very joyful time in his life, a time when he was even engaged to be married, when he was really quite innocent. But he's also shown when Belle, his fiance, breaks off their relationship because she realizes he will never love her the way he loves money. And he becomes a bit sad, and he, he starts to become quite reflective. Well, the ghost of Christmas past moves on. The ghost of Christmas present comes. And he's shown his current employee, Bob Cratchit, whose son, Tiny Tim, suffers from a disease that will, as the ghost tells him, take his life if something doesn't happen. There's very little for them to eat. There's not really any presents it's just kind of a dull Christmas. He's shown other things, but uh, the thing that strikes him the most is the home of his employee, Bob Cratchit, who is joyful in spite of all of the difficulty. He doesn't have money, and yet he still has joy. And Ebenezer Scrooge is a little confounded by this. And then the ghost of Christmas yet to come no one mourns the loss of Ebenezer Scrooge. He's shown his memorial service after he passes away, and he discovers that people only came because there was a free dinner associated with the memorial. He's also shown that his gravestone, his tombstone, would be very neglected. No one would come and visit it. No one would ever bring flowers, and it would become overgrown with brambles. He asks the ghost of Christmas future to show him a memorial and a grave of someone who was beloved, and he's shown the memorial of Tiny Tim. And at Tiny Tim's memorial, remember this is Christmas future, so it's things that have not yet come to pass. Everyone is celebrating the life of Tiny Tim. Many people are gathered together in mourning, and his grave is very well taken care of. Ebenezer Scrooge weeps bitterly at the knowledge that no one cares for him. He has all of these things, and yet he has no one whom he cares for or who cares for him. And so when he wakes up on Christmas morning, he wakes up and vows to be a very different man. He immediately makes a large contribution to the charity that the day before he had rejected outright. He sends someone, a young messenger, to the shop down the street to buy the largest turkey that they have to make sure that the Cratchit family's table is well supplied on Christmas Day. He then also gives Bob Cratchit a raise and the day off. He begins treating everyone with generosity and kindness. And essentially the story ends with Ebenezer Scrooge, a changed man.
Now, maybe you're wondering, why am I talking about a Christmas carol, an Ebenezer Scrooge in a sermon? Maybe you're wondering that. Maybe you're not. You might just be enjoying the story, and that's wonderful, too. But I'd like to share with you where we get the name Ebenezer from. My son read that scripture passage, 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, for us um, in our scripture reading today. But turn with me in your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen and called its name Ebenezer. For he said, till now the Lord has helped us. These were during the days of the prophet Samuel. This was after Samuel had been given to the Lord, dedicated by his mother Hannah, um, and served underneath Eli the priest. This was before the days of Saul the king and David the king. And in between, Samuel was the judge over Israel. Perhaps you remember the beginning of the book of Ruth. It says, in the days when the judges were judging Israel. Or perhaps you remember the book of Judges itself. This was a time when there was not a king or a monarch, but rather those who were of the class of prophet and wise man. And they had a close communion with God, and they led Uh, the people of Israel through divine wisdom and direct communication from God through the prophet. Well, the people had strayed away from God, and Samuel had called them back to God. Put away your idols. Destroy your temples. Destroy your Asherah poles. And come back to God. And the people did this. They had suffered some defeats at the hands of the Philistines. And so they came back to God with a full and a whole heart. And as they came back to God, Samuel said, Gather all the people together at Mizpah, and we will offer a sacrifice, and we will pray to God. We will re-consecrate our nation to the service of God. And so all the people came. They would put away their idols. They had destroyed the temples. They had taken down the Asherah poles. And they came together at Mizpah, and being very opportunistic, the Philistines heard that all of the children of Israel were gathered at Mizpah, and they thought, this is our opportunity to deliver that decisive blow to our enemy. We've already taken a bit of their land. If we kill them here, we can take all their land. And so the Philistines gather together for battle, and they come marching towards Mizpah, and the people are scared. They've just given up their sense of self-dependence by worshiping idols. They've finally given up this sense of self-dependence, and they've gathered together to worship God, and Samuel says, don't be afraid. God sees what you have done, and he will honor you. And so Samuel offered a sacrifice of a young nursing lamb. There on the altar, they offered the sacrifice to God. He prayed to the Lord that the Lord would deliver them, and God sent a thunderstorm so ferocious, so terrible, that the Philistines were quaking in fear, and they just fled. They just ran. Now, I've known a few different people who served in artillery in the different wars. One such individual I knew out in Port Angeles, he had been a Navy artillery gunner in Vietnam. He never saw direct combat in the sense of being face to face with an enemy shooting back at him, but for three years he was on a ship constantly boom, 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 sending the shelling out. And he said, Ever since then, he always had a little bit of a shake. His nerves had just been completely fried by that experience. Now, I imagine that, you know, modern-day artillery shelling or bombing of some kind is about as close as you can get to a terrific thunderstorm. But God sent thunder down upon the Philistines. Have you ever been right near a lightning flash and the thunder goes off like right above you? If you've ever had that experience, you know just how awe-inspiring this could be. Now imagine that God is behind it, not just a a natural storm, and he goes boom, 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 right on top of the Philistine army. This was probably a horrific thing to behold. No wonder they were running in fear. 
God intervened with thunder, and the Philistines ran, and the Israelites pursued after them and took the lives of the Philistines all the way back to their homeland. After this terrific military victory for the Israelites, Samuel then went between Mizpah and Shen, set up a large stone, and called it Ebenezer. And he said, because thus far, or until now, the Lord has helped us. In Hebrew, Ebenezer is actually two words, Eben Ezer, uh, compound word, until now, the Lord has helped us. So when we use the name Ebenezer, or when we sing about it in the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, perhaps you remember, I believe, the third verse in that song, Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come. We are saying, thus far... The Lord has helped us. Until now, the Lord has helped us. Charles Dickens knew this when he wrote A Christmas Carol, and the character of Ebenezer Scrooge was completely dependent on this external help to make the change that he did. If, and as some uh, scholars postulate, this is a Christian novel or novella that Charles Dickens wrote, If it is, then it's God who's sending these visions to Ebenezer Scrooge. Obviously, it's a work of fiction, so it didn't actually happen. So please go with me here. But some are postulating that Charles Dickens had God as this main character sending these ghosts to Ebenezer Scrooge. And his name is Ebenezer because none of this could have happened unless he had received external, outside help. Unless someone else had intervened and helped him, he could not have experienced the change that he did. Without God's help, the Israelites never would have defeated the Philistines. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I have come. Well, as I mentioned earlier, we just returned from Hawaii, and one of the highlights for our family was visiting the memorial at Pearl Harbor. When very significant things happen in a nation's history, we oftentimes make a memorial or build a memorial. And I feel I should mention it here because this coming week will be the anniversary, December 7, of that fateful day that, as President Roosevelt described it, a day which will live in infamy. And I have to say, it was quite moving to be there and to look around, to look out at Ford Island from across there. In fact, you can see it just in the background behind the USS Arizona's anchor. To look at the hills around and to realize that this is where the planes came in. This is where they made their bombing runs. This is where all the explosions and all of that happened. It's a very, very sobering and humbling feeling to be there. Well, we took the ride out to the USS Arizona Memorial. Here it is on the water. And you don't realize it when you're there because that memorial itself is really quite small. It's not all that large. You don't realize how huge of a ship is lying just underneath the water there. Well, our family went through. You can see the American flag flying over the memorial. Bradley's there. Cassie doesn't like pictures, so you won't see her in any of these. <laughs> and that's all right. We, we were all there anyway. And then here are the names of all of those who perished that day. And they also have a special um, section there for those who served on the Arizona and survived, but later in life, in their death, they have chosen to be interred there on the USS Arizona with their shipmates, which I thought was a very moving thing as well. And then after we saw the USS Arizona, we went over to the battleship Missouri. Now this is the place where they signed, I wanna make sure I say this correct, The instrument of surrender, it's not a peace agreement, it was the instrument of surrender, which signified the unconditional surrender of the Empire of Japan. And right where that little uh, circle is in the ground that they have uh, roped off, that was where General MacArthur sat on the table there in Tokyo Harbor and signed the instrument of surrender with the um, representatives of the Empire of Japan. And there's Bradley posing for it and a picture of the spot commemorating it. You can see the Arizona Memorial just off in the background in the picture on the right. 
But when you get onto a ship like this battleship, you realize that this is a massive ship. This is truly huge. A, it had a crew of well over a thousand people. It's truly awe-inspiring. We only got to tour the limited portion of the ship that they allow you on, and it would have been very easy to get lost in that portion unless you knew where you were going, unless you had all the little signs, green arrows, this way, this way, this way, this way. That was very, very helpful. But how easy it might be with such large and awe-inspiring pieces of machinery that can bring to bear huge amounts of firepower to begin to trust in things like that, to begin to think oneself or one's nation quite mighty, in fact, quite untouchable, until you go just a little bit down the harbor and you realize that a mighty ship of war like that can still be sunk. Many of the lives who serve there can still be lost. We can't trust in things like that, ultimately, can we? Now, I don't think there's any problem here on this side of eternity having some pride for your nation. You know, I'm an American, and when I see things like that, it's very moving to me. I know many of you come from many other nations around this world, and when you see things of your home nation, you're filled with that warmth and nostalgia if it's good things that are happening, and if it's bad things that are happening, a part of you hurts and aches because of those things. That's perfectly normal. That's perfectly natural. But when we start trusting in things like our own ethnicity or in the firepower that can come from that or our ability to earn advanced degrees that can earn us a very large paycheck like Ebenezer Scrooge, we begin to trust in the size of our bank account instead of the one who can ultimately give us peace. It was truly impressive to go see that memorial. It was very moving. But none of those things can be trusted when it comes to our ultimate peace. In 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, yeah, thank you, Chris. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Ebenezer Scrooge had a very large bank account. His balance sheets were very big. And yet, he loved no one, and no one loved him, and that broke his heart. He realized he couldn't trust money. The United States has gone to war numerous times, and we've suffered incredible defeats as well as achieved great victories. Many other nations have warred. Many lives have been lost. Many victories have been won. But we can't trust in those things. We can't trust in our good health. We can't trust in the fact that we just made good, wise decisions. Therefore, everything is going to be okay. But there's only one whom we can put this kind of trust in, and his name is Jesus. And he was born as a helpless babe in a little town called Bethlehem. He was born in a stable. He wasn't born with all of the nice refinements that you might expect to find at the birth of nobility. Rather, he was born with cattle over in the next stall probably smelled of animals. In fact, I'm certain that it did. There was nothing refined about it. You see, God took what was strong and powerful in the things that mankind naturally trusts in, and he got rid of all of them when it came to his son, Jesus. Jesus didn't come with military might or with power. He didn't come with royal uh, on guards or you know, royal entourage to blow trumpets in front of him and to herald his coming. Rather, he came with humility, with no money, being born in the worst of accommodations. It was not a mighty warrior or a weapon that God used to defeat Satan, but humility and self-sacrificing love. These were the weapons of heaven, and these are to be our weapons. 
because these are our only hope. You see, it's the manger and the cross. The Son of God's self-humbling to be willing to leave heaven, come to this earth, and unite himself with humanity, and to risk being born as a human child. That's the weapon of heaven, this weapon of humility. And for that child to grow up and not become the commander of a great army, but rather to offer himself as the sacrifice for our sin at Calvary. That is the weapon of heaven. We can be impressed by many things. We can drive down here on Marine View Drive and be impressed by the warships there. Nothing wrong with serving one's country, nothing wrong with appreciating what it can do, but we can't trust too much in those sorts of things because Jesus and his way of humility and self-sacrifice is the only way because Jesus himself is our Ebenezer. Jesus is described as the stone which the builders rejected. Jesus is the one whom the builders rejected but became the cornerstone. In Daniel chapter two, King Nebuchadnezzar is given the vision of this immense statue, this impressive statue that for, by all human accounts is Wow, this is incredible. If you had that kind of statue in your possession, everyone would fear and tremble before you because they knew that you were the greatest, you were the most powerful, you were the mightiest. And Daniel tells King Nebuchadnezzar, you, O king, you are the head of gold. You're the greatest component, the most precious metal of this awe-inspiring statue. And yet... When we get all the way down through to the end of the vision, at the end of the vision, a rock, a stone, comes and strikes the image on the feet and destroys the whole thing. All of the wisdom, all of the might, all the power of man is destroyed and crushed on this rock. Because that rock is Jesus. And all of the wisdom, the power, and the might of mankind God says, those are not my ways. My ways are humble. My ways are lowly. My way is that of self-sacrificing love. My way is born in a manger. My way does not seek its own good, but gives itself up for others. You see, this is what Jesus does. Jesus, our Ebenezer, So my question is for you, or my challenge this Christmas season, is consider Jesus as your Ebenezer. Remember, Ebenezer is not just the first name of a protagonist in a play by Charles Dickens. But Ebenezer means, thus far the Lord has helped me. Jesus is our Ebenezer. In what ways has the Lord helped you? In what ways has God brought your life to the place that it is now? What ways might your life be different if God had not intervened and done something for you? If God had not showed up, revealed himself to you, given you the call, come, follow me, how might your life be different? What has God done? What is it that God has done for you? How is Jesus your Ebenezer? Pray with me today. Lord, we are here in your presence recognizing you are truly the reason for this Christmas season. Lord, we ask that as we remember things like Pearl Harbor, as we remember things like 9-11, as we remember all of the incredible things that have happened in our world, some much more tragic than others, that as we look back and memorialize these things, that we would take the time to look back and reflect on just exactly what it is that you have done for us. And Lord, I know, I am confident that as we have that reflection, we will see that you have helped us tremendously. 
that there are so many things that could not possibly have happened, could not possibly have come to bear in our lives had you not directly intervened and done something. And Lord, as we consider you and we consider that you left heaven and came to this earth as a babe in this Christmas season, as we consider and look forward to the cross that you would bear, to your resurrection, that we would see that it's not the wisdom of the world, it's not the size of the bank accounts, it's not the military might that defeats evil, but your self-sacrificing love, your character. These are the humble weapons of heaven that have won the complete victory. Lord, help us to accept those in our life. Help us to accept you in our life as we consider you as our Ebenezer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing hymn number 204, Come, Thou Long-Expected Jesus. to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.
thank you for joining us. If you would like to learn about the opportunities available through Forest Park Seventh-day Adventist Church, such as Outreach, Service, and Forest Park Adventist Christian School, visit this website. If you are in our area, we would be delighted to have you worship with us at this address, 